So good evening, everybody. As some of you know, my name is Michelle Good, and I am the uh, J.V. Klein lecturer for Green College this, um, this academic year and part of next academic year. And some of you may be surprised to see Eleanor Sunchild here today. Um, Eleanor, uh, we had originally planned for Jessica McDermott, the author of Highway of Tears, to attend today. Um, but she had a health issue that prevented her from being here. And I must thank with all my heart, uh, Eleanor, who on very short notice agreed to come and speak with me and to converse and to engage in some questions and answers with the, uh, with the folks that are here today with respect to the Colton Bushi tragedy. And um, Eleanor is a member of the Thunderchild First Nation in Saskatchewan from similar area to where I'm from in Red Pheasant. Um, I'm, I'm a member of Red Pheasant and the Bucci family is, are my relations. Uh, Eleanor graduated from the University of Alberta, um, their Faculty of Law in 1998 and has been a member of the Saskatchewan Bar since 1999. She has a, a bachelor's degree in political science and completed her undergraduate in French, no less, <laughs> um, at the University of, um, of Alberta. Eleanor is the uh, owner and uh, primary lawyer, managing lawyer of Sunchild Law in Saskatchewan, which is on the second Poundmaker Reserve and specializes in Indigenous law. We share a common uh, practice history in that both of us represented Indigenous uh, residential school survivors for many, many years. And both of us have been immersed in the challenges and, um, and successes and victories of work that I believe that we're both very proud of. Um, she is um, a wonderful speaker, has presented nationally and internationally on the legacy of the Indian residential school system and the impact of colonial policy in Canada. She has attended at the United Nations, I believe, when the Bushi family went to give testimony there with respect to the racism, that the systemic racism, the pervasive systemic racism that was the underlying, uh, primary underlying factor in how the death of Colton Bushi was handled by the justice system. She has four lovely children and is married to the love of her life and is um, working very hard at raising children who will take up the cause, I'm sure, when it's time for her to rest. And so without any further ado, what I would like to, oh, I would also like to note that in, I think it was 1998, correct me if I'm wrong, Eleanor was recognized for her um, tremendous work as a legal professional by being given the QC designation. So without any further ado, I would like to ask uh, Evelyn, if, or Eleanor, <laughs> if she would give us, <laughs> um, both of us are a little bit under the weather. I had surgery, she had dental surgery, but we're here and we're, <laughs> and we're soldiering on. Um, so she, uh, I, I will ask you, Eleanor, if you could just sort of give us a thumbnail sketch of, you know, the day of the terrible event and how things proceeded to where we are today. And I'll let everybody know that's here today that we will open for questions probably, um, you know, at six or 10 after six, and please put your questions in the chat and we'll take it from there. And so with that, I give you Eleanor. Thank you, everybody. I actually got my QC in 2018. Oh, I sorry. Just looked, at my, I just looked at my letter over there. Um, you know, I think it was it, like I worked hard for it, but also we raised so much controversy after uh, the acquittal calling for an inquiry and such that I think that was probably part of the reason I got the QC. So I dedicate that QC to Colton. And I did that when I, uh, when I accepted it. And I also dedicate it to the memory of all the Indian residential school survivors that, that I assisted, that 
at this firm, I think we helped over, well, thousands anyway. And now, now we're doing day school claims as well. <clears throat> Indian day school claims are just as bad as residential school claims. People are going to start hearing about them soon, uh, but they're just as bad. Anyway, so yesterday we had uh, a press conference at Dakota Dunes in Saskatoon to talk about the reaction to the recommendations from the CRCC. And uh, it was a really, um, like whenever we do the advocacy work, uh, even as a lawyer, it, take, it does take me right back to that, to the time he was shot and killed. And I know um, Alvin Baptiste, Debbie's brother, had contacted you, Michelle, too, at that time when they were trying to figure out what exactly, first, what had happened and what should they do because they felt and they were right that the discrimination and racism stacked the justice system against them. And so on, he was shot on August 9th, 2016. And I, I knew um, Alvin Baptiste through, cause his wife, his wife is from my reserve, right? Cause we're all, you know, we're all related, right? And Cree people know every, they know, know everybody's families and <clears throat> we all, support each other. So Alvin had contacted me, I think the next day after, after Colton was killed. And he said something like, Eleanor, I don't know what to do. My nephew was shot and Debbie's asking me for help. And the, the RCMP issued this press release that they were stealing and <clears throat> they weren't stealing. So I told him, I said, well, Alvin, uh, then we have to go to the press. We have to, um, <clears throat> we have to tell, tell your side, your family's side of what happened and we have to make them accountable. So right from the start, right from the next day after Colton was shot, um, they've been looking for accountability. Anyway, so the next day they come out with that press release and that's that's spoke about in the um, report from the CRCC. They talk about how the press release um, wasn't entirely, well, they said it wasn't discriminatory or racist. I would disagree, but they said that it was, it caused a racial divide within Saskatchewan. Um, which it did. And it just contained enough information for people to make a, a decision, an uninformed decision about what had occurred. So the press release read something like uh, there was a shooting. No, there was a, there's an investigation into proper, a property related crime or a theft investigation. I can't, I don't know the exact wording. It was theft investigation that a, a, shooting, a shooting occurred in the context of a theft investigation. Okay, yeah, yeah. a shooting occurred in the context of a theft investigation where, where somebody was killed. Or do you have it right before you, Michelle? I don't, but if you want to carry on, I can get that. I can have it. Okay. Anyway, it used that language like there was there was a theft investigation and a life was lost. Not that it was um, not that it was uh, <clears throat> a murder. There was no mention that young Colton Bushi was shot in the back of the head. So that that day, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations they issued their own press release stating that the RCMP was prejudicial and allowed the average person to draw their own conclusions that the shooting was somehow justified. So that's how it started off. And, and to me and to many others, and that this is talked about in the CRCC report as well. So the CCR, the, the complaint commission report says that um, 
the investigation itself wasn't based in discrimination. But again, again, I believe that this whole case was based in systemic discrimination. And right from the um, investigation, uh, there were there were issues. And if you look at that report, you'll see the issues that they outline in there, like they make all kinds of recommendations. And I'll go through those after I tell you the sequence of what, um, how the investigation went down. So it seemed from that initial press release that they were treating the killing as a property crime and not a murder. And therefore they weren't investigating the killing to the degree of care that it required. <clears throat> and this, um, this is the systemic racism that, that we're talking about. At that first court appearance, um, were you at the first court appearance, Michelle? I was at the bail hearing. Yeah, so the bail, the first court appearance was in the morning at provincial court in North Battleford. And then the, the bail hearing itself, <coughs> they moved over to the court of Queen's bench in the afternoon um, and that's, that's where Michelle and I were interacting with the family as well. But at that first court appearance, you could see like that the systemic racism was on full display. There were snipers witness, like people saw snipers on the roof. I um, saw I saw the snipers yeah. on the roof. I yeah, was you there. saw the snipers I, too. I, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't in the courthouse, but I was outside with the people that were protesting. Right. right. And, and I saw the snipers on the roof. Yeah. So there, there were snipers on the roof of the North Battleford liquor store, which is just across the street from the courthouse. And they say like the RCMP said, no, those were cameras, but um, they weren't, they were snipers. And, and uh, for some reason, like we talk, I, I remember talking to the CRCC about the snipers. I recall talking to the CRCC about the conduct of the RCMP on that first day of, of court hearings. And none of that is in the report. And I don't know why, but um, the way that we talk, when I talked to the CRCC, I told them like it, it was way over the top what the RCMP present was at the courthouse, at the bail hearing, at the prelim, and that wasn't mentioned. Anyway, so there were there were like the snipers. And as you said, there were many, many supporters, both indigenous and non-indigenous, who were present at that first court appearance. And the, the RCMP's behavior even there troubled me because they directed so much resources and so many bodies to the family of Gerald Stanley. Like they were, they walked them into the courthouse. The RCMP walked Gerald Stanley's family into the courthouse. They sat them in the courtroom. And then uh, the, the guards who were there in the courthouse, they actually stood with their backs to the Stanley family, which to me indicates that they were protecting the Stanley family from the indigenous people who were on the other side of the Stanley family. And that was the, log the logistics. And I, I don't know if they thought about what they were really doing while like, why were they protecting the family of an accused murderer? It, it was just uh, beyond me. I just, I can't understand it. And <clears throat> even at lunch, even at lunch, the RCMP es escorted the family of Gerald Stanley to the North Battleford RCMP detachment for lunch. And I know that because uh, the RCMP told me, they told myself and they told Sheldon Whitney, uh, the former chief of Red Pheasant that they took Gerald Stanley's family to lunch at the RCMP station because they, they felt that that was the best way to keep the peace. Like they really thought that that was a good plan. And I remember talking to them and saying like, how is this a good plan? How is taking the family of an accused to the RCMP detachment 
for lunch a good idea when you have the family of a murder victim who are getting, you know, at that point they were starting to get uh, a lot of hatred directed to them. Like how is, how is that a good idea when you're not protecting the other side, the, the victims, the family of the victim in this case, like it, and that's how it, that's how it seemed to be throughout the whole process. Indeed. And, you know, just going back a little bit, just, just going back a little bit to give a little bit more of a foundation to it. Within hours after Colton Bushi, well, first of all, for those of you that, that may not know, Colton was in the back seat of the vehicle sleeping. sleeping. When, sleeping. When the, uh, when the vehicle went on to the Stanley property in look, looking for assistance because it was almost entirely disabled and then subsequently became disabled. Um, the, um, uh, two, of the, two of the young men that were in the vehicle jumped out and they were fooling around on an ATV that was beside there. They didn't start it, they didn't run it, they didn't try and take it, they just- Actually, it looked. was it was just Eric. It was just Eric, one. That's right. It was just one. Yeah. And he basically sat on it and that was the end of it. Um, Mr. Stanley, the um, person who shot Colton and his son raced forward. His son um, smashed the windshield of the vehicle the kids were in with an ax. Um, Mr. Stanley then approached the two, two other young men jumped out of the car and ran because they were terrified and um, gave evidence that there were shots fired over them as they ran. Um, Mr. Bushi Colton woke up, jumped into the front seat and was trying to get away. He was trying to drive away from the property when the vehicle was approached by Mr. Stanley. Mr. Stanley shot Colton Bushi in the back of the head at close range. <clears throat> yeah. From there, um, the, uh, you know, a number of things happened in terms of the investigation, but the RCMP for some uh, reason that I don't necessarily understand and, and Eleanor might believed that the uh, two young men or at least one of them had that had left the scene were armed. There was no reason to believe they were armed, but believed they were armed and that they had gone to Colton, Colton's mother's house. I believe it was seven officers that then surrounded, seven RCMP officers that surrounded Ms. Bo uh, Colton's mother, Debbie Baptiste, surrounded her home, entered the home, told her Colton's dead. Just like that. Yeah, I she think it was the word where uh, they barge into her, they surround her house, they shine the spotlights on her house, they have their weapons drawn, they barge into her house. One of them says, who is Colton Bushy to you? And she goes, that's my son. And then he, one of the officer goes, oh, he's deceased. Then she falls to the floor crying probably, I think she was saying, no, no, not my son. And then uh, one of the officers says some like pick her up and then they tell her, get yourself together. And then she's crying. Meanwhile, they are barging through all the houses, all the rooms in the house looking for something. <clears throat> and then she says to one of them, um, no, I'm, it can't be, I'm just waiting for my son. I have his dinner in the microwave. And then one of them goes and opens the microwave. To, as though she's lying. And, as though. and then asked her if she was drunk and one or more of the officers smelled her breath. Yes. She they was did. drunk. <laughs> this is a mother whose child has just been murdered. And this was the manner in which they were treated. But even more troubling to me in that regard was how the RCMP, and you can comment on this, Eleanor, excuse me, 
um, how the RCMP, and you're talking about it now, how they treated the family of the accused, okay? Right. And one of the things that happened, and yet we understand that there are certain realities that arise from the fact of an investigation happening in a rural environment, and there's distances between, you know, cities, towns, and, and a farm. But following the um, following the killing of, of Colton, his wife, Mr. Stanley's wife and his son went back into their home, sat down and drank coffee and waited for the police. And in my submission, drank coffee and got their stories straight. Um, and this is another thing that is raised in the uh, CRCC, which is for those that might not know, it's the um, Civilian Review and Complaint Commission. Um, uh, is they raised that after they arrested um, Mr. Stanley, they allowed his wife and his son to travel together to give their statements to the RCMP in big, bigger Saskatchewan. They made no effort to do what is the most, what I, what I think is one of the most basic investigative procedures, which is to limit the contact between witnesses. And they didn't, you know, from North Battleford, how far is it? But how many, how long does it take to, from North Battleford to bigger? At least an hour, eh? Yeah, they, they went to the bigger detachment though. No, that's what I mean, but they went from North Battleford because they went from North Battleford first and then yeah. after he was detained in custody until the bail hearing, they allowed the wife and, and son to drive to Bigger, which would be at least an hour drive. The right wife from the very the beginning, there was this perceivable discrepancy in terms of how the family of the victim was treated and how the family and the, of the accused and the accused were treated. It was physically visible. You could just see it as Eleanor is, is speaking to with respect to taking them to lunch. And when she speaks about the, uh, the concern the family had for their own safety, what she's referring to is the incredible backlash after, I couldn't find that article, I'm sorry. But after the, uh, the news of this hit the press, there were, and it was also, and specifically because of those references by, by Sergeant Olberg, okay, that this occurred in the context of a, of a theft investigation, the media comments, the outcry of right-wing Saskatchewan was one of the most extraordinary things that I've seen in my life. There were comments in the media in response to these stories like, the only, the only mistake Gerald Stanley make, made was not to kill the other three and bury them in the back 40. This is true. It was written down. And that, you know, that was only one. And it went on. Those kinds of, of responses, those kinds of just unapologetically hideous responses of, you know, racism and vitriol and... Um, and you know, just the, the absolute ugliness of it has gone on basically since that time. There, I know that there have been times when it has eased, but it, now with the release of the CRCC report, the comments are jumping up again. You know, how he was a thief. The boy didn't have a criminal record. He was a thief. He deserved what he got. You know, quit complaining. You just, you know, you people are all the same. All of that just, just, unabashed, hideous racism. Um, and then <laughs> there was the question of the, um, of the charge approval. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you, you're probably clearer on this, Eleanor, than I am, but I believe that he was never, the charge approval I think was for m manslaughter, was it not? It never rose, oh no. It was, that's right. It was second degree murder or manslaughter. And, um, and, uh, and that, you know, and then <laughs> we have the bail hearing and we have a person that has resources to leave who has just committed this heinous, violent, thoughtless, 
crime and, um, and he's released and he's released on a nominal bond with some limitations. He got to stay on his own farm. <laughs> so, I, I mean, right from the very beginning, it, it wasn't as if, and I, I think probably, Eleanor, you feel the same way, that we were waiting there with bated breath for, for justice to occur. Right from the beginning, it was clear to us what was gonna happen, and it did. You know, there wasn't a single person of color on the jury. Um, the, uh, and I mean, this has ultimately led to a change in the law with respect to uh, uh, preemptions from juries without reason. And that's an excellent thing. But for Colton, it meant that there wasn't a single person of color in an area of the country where indigenous people are the majority population, the majority of the population. Yeah. So. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just, if I could just jump in here. Yeah. Um, there's just a few things that I'd like to say in comments. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a lawyer for the family. So uh, we have a lawsuit against our family right now. A civil lawsuit. Co counsel is Chris Murphy. Um, a lot of people think that, that I'm family of Colton, and I guess I, I am now because uh, it's, such a, it's such an important case. He's probably the most important case I'll ever have. And as I was talking to Chris today about that. And what do we do next? I said, well, we should make sure there's never another Colton. That, that there's no other indigenous um, young men shot, shot and killed on their territorial land. So <clears throat> there's a film about it. I'd like I'd like to uh, plug it. The, have you guys watched? Have you guys watched it? Eleanor will is leaving and is going to come back in and hopefully our sound issue will will resolve itself. But um, yeah. So in the interim. You know, we've talked about, and I don't know if anybody was here for our media, um, our conversation about media, but, you know, <laughs> this is yet another example of how Indigenous people are demonized in the press. There was no is evidence. Is this better? Yes, much better. Okay. Try your video okay. and see if it'll sustain. Actually, it's my camera, so I'll just, maybe I'll just okay. leave it off. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I was just going to tell everybody that there's a film. I don't, did they watch the film as part of the? No, it, it's like, a, like we, you could talk about the film. Some people okay. may have seen it, but but you know it's hard to say who. Yeah, because uh, just because in this limited time of this lecture, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to talk about everything that mm -hmm. went on, but. The film does a really good um, job of pointing out a lot of the issues with the whole entire case. And it's called Nipa Wista Masawin. We will stand up and it's on the National Film Board uh, website. So if you haven't watched it, I would just, I would suggest that you do watch it. I, I would, I second that wholeheartedly. It's a beautiful film. It's a beautiful, beautiful film, even though it covers this terrible tragedy, it does so in such a deeply thoughtful way. And, and I think it would really uh, help people to understand a different perspective than what, they're, one, what they may have seen in the media or what they've seen in the non-Indigenous comments in the media and those kinds of things. Um, but but in, in summary, the acquittal of Gerald Stanley um, and to this day, I do not know, I cannot understand why Crown did not appeal the conviction. The conviction, or the, sorry, acquittal, it's wishful thinking. The acquittal of Gerald Stanley was based almost entirely on evidence from experts regarding what's called a hang fire, where a person allegedly can pull a trigger and, uh, and there will be a, a delay in the discharge of the of the of the weapon, 
And this is really the evidence that swayed the jury, um, in my opinion. And um, the reason that I don't understand why it was an acquittal is because regardless of whether it was a hang fire, a person with a weapon is responsible for the proper care and safety and use of that weapon. That weapon was a restricted weapon and should he should have not had the access that he had to the weapon and he handled it contrary to law. I don't believe that he was even found guilty on a weapons charge, was he, Eleanor? Uh, of storing them, of uh, storing it improperly. But That's, I mean, he... <laughs> Yeah, he killed a boy and he was found guilty of improperly storing a weapon. And um, yeah, so, you know, in, in effect, that's what happened. He gets to live the rest of his life. Um, yeah, and there, if I can jump in here, there were a lot of issues with the investigation itself. And if you um, read the, the CRCC report, um, <clears throat> it goes through some of the issues such as the uh, SUV that Colton was shot in being left out in the rain for two days. So the officers knew that there was a storm coming and it rained 44 millimeters um, and they didn't tarp it. They didn't cover it, even though they could have and should have, they didn't. So blood spatter washed away. Uh, who knows, there could have been footprints out, out there. there. They never... The bullet was never found actually that actually killed Colton. So um, it's, it's puzzling where the bullet actually went. <clears throat> um, and then there was a, there was a whole part in the trial about a, like a bullet with a bulge, which was really odd too. Like the whole, the whole testimony about the, the guns and the gun and the bulging bullet. And like, it was all really like confusing and not clear. And then they brought in like um, a lay witness. So just a, a witness off the street who said, you know, I had a hang fire 40 years ago. I was shooting a gopher and I had a, I had a hang fire, right? It was all really odd. The evidence was odd. And, and in my opinion, there should have been a, an appeal, like you said, based on that evidence surrounding um, surrounding the gun and the use of, of lay witnesses, like witnesses who aren't experts and the weight, the weight that is attributed to their evidence or the, like how much uh, authority they actually give to somebody off the street, um, like a, not an expert as opposed to, you know, a gun expert who makes their living studying and analyzing weaponry so it was just odd that whole that whole evidence was confusing for a jury. I'm sure we'll never know what the jury, how the jury came to a conclusion, because that's some um, privileged information. But it was not clear, and and so anyway, back to the uh, just just a few little comments on the evidence. So they left the SUV out in the rain, washed away evidence. Um, by the rain, then they didn't actually bring in a blood spatter expert to look at the scene. Like they did not treat this crime scene like a murder scene. They treated it, in my opinion, like a, a, a property crime. Like I've seen, I've seen mischief charges pursued and prosecuted uh, in a more diligent manner than this one was like just the number of officers that were um <clears throat> that were uh present and and the preservation of the evidence and you know how they how they dealt with it like the rcmp and that's that's in the report they could have done they should have done a better job so in my opinion um given the problem then they they waited to get a warrant so that was the problem with the rain washing away the evidence is that they didn't get a warrant right away 
then they couldn't explain why they didn't get a warrant right away. Um, and that also, in my opinion, had they got a warrant right away, started processing the scene right away, Colton wouldn't had to have lay out in the, laid out in the rain. He lay, and the family has, and they should have such a big issue with that, like Colton lying out in the rain um, for you know a, a, a long time, longer than he should have um, on the ground, just being rained on. And that's basically how they treated his body in humane and for for our in our culture as indigenous people when somebody dies like there's a whole ritual ceremony to that there's a whole way that you treat a body and that um leaving someone out on the ground in the rain alone uh violates that traditional law those traditional teachings so <clears throat> that's another you know another um, indignity, another indignity in racism that this family was subjected to. So the, the flawed investigation, um, the court proceedings, <clears throat> the, pre the selection of the all white jury. And there were, there were uh, phrases thrown around that courtroom that weren't, that shouldn't have been allowed, like your home is your castle and uh, throwing around terms of like uh, protecting, protecting like property rights. But even though <clears throat> that wasn't, that wasn't part of the defense, like the defense was a accidental um, hang fire, right? It wasn't uh, self-defense. It wasn't defense of property yet. The language, the lingo, was the terms were being thrown around in that courtroom and they, sh they shouldn't have been allowed to yes. because, <clears throat> because there's a jury there. Well, so, and, it, and what you say is really important, Eleanor, because, um, you know, uh, a man's home is his castle. It, it, it was giving a suggestion and it was creating an, an inference. It was creating a belief in the people who would ultimately make a decision that a person has a right to defend their property against trespassing by violent means. And that's yeah. not the law. That's not the law at all. And that, but, and that also fed the ongoing vitriol, the ongoing racism um, about they got what they deserved you know, they were trespassing, they were stealing, they got what they deserved, or he got what he deserved. And, um, you know, the, the, it, it was, and, and I, you know, the, the lack of response of the Crown, in terms of raising that as a specific, um, prejud highly prejudicial statement, and, you know, um, not seeking instructions that the jury give no consideration to those kinds of comments. That is what I think we're looking at when we're talking about systemic racism, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, there was a, I can't think of the right word at the moment, but that, that things that would have, I believe would have happened if um, the victim had not been indigenous there were many of those things that didn't happen in the trial of Gerald Stanley. And one of them was objections and seeking instructions from the judge in terms of what is a person's right in terms of defending their property and what isn't their right. And, right. and I, I really believe that was a huge factor in, in how things ultimately came out, because you're absolutely right, Eleanor, even though the stated defense was self-defense, okay, the argument really was founded on a notion that he was within his rights, that Gerald Stanley was, in his, was within his rights to do what he did. That was the, the, uh, um, the heart of the argument, really even if it was perhaps um, uh, subtle and not so subtle, it was there. And, 
you know, the, the evidence with respect to self-defense was thin. It was as thin as thin could be. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and also, you know, they played on the stereotype of the drunken Indian, uh, drunken thieving Indian versus the hardworking Saskatchewan farmer. Like I, Jer, uh, defense lawyer said, just put yourself in Jerry's boots. Put yourself in Jerry's hardworking, like he said, put yourself in Jerry's boots when he's talking to the jury. Um, and then when it came to, when it came to questioning the uh, witnesses, so the witness, then this is in the report, the CRCC report, the, the witnesses were traumatized. The, one of the witnesses, the key witness who was there when Colton was shot, she was taken on a high speed chase. She was taken on a high speed chase in one of the police cruisers. And they said, oh, we forgot she was there. Um, you know, so when they gave their statements, they, they, they were found out when they were in North Battleford cells, those witnesses, uh, those three witnesses that Colton had died. Uh, I'm like, somebody had told them, I don't know, they must've heard it from the officer or something. And then, and they, they were like, that's how they found out. So they were really um, <clears throat> traumatized. They were uh, hung over because yes, they were drinking. Um, they were- uh, It's not against the law for a group of kids- Not against the law to drink. And drink, right? It's not, not against the law. No, it's not against the law. The one witness had, she, she testified, like she said, I had uh, blood all over, Colton's blood all over my clothes. And they want, and I had to give my statement like that. So that they were given, they were not treated well when they had to give their statements. But on the other hand, Gerald Stanley's statement, it was played in court. The officer was like, um, do you need a drink of water? Do you want some coffee? Is there anything, you know, I can do for you? Uh, and I think he called his lawyer a number of times during that interview. Like he was given every comfort, every, um, like he was treated well and, and witnesses are supposed to be treated well. Yes. Their human rights are not supposed to be violated, but those indigenous witnesses who were held, who were the one who was taken on a high speed chase, they weren't treated the same. So of course, when they went to testify, their statements weren't weren't match, they didn't match because they were, um, <clears throat> they were traumatized. They were hung over. Their friend had been shot. They had, one had to give this a statement wearing clothes that had his blood on them. And then during the trial, there were all kinds of questions about their level of intoxication. How much did you drink? What kind of drinking? What kind of alcohol? Where did you get the alcohol? And so the levels, like I, I understand, I, I've done a lot of criminal trial, criminal law, and I know that the levels of intoxication of witnesses are, are important. However, in this trial, the levels of intoxication of those witnesses played right into the stereotypes of the drunken Indian. And then one of the witnesses was callously shown the photo of Colton's body deceased beside the vehicle. And he broke down on the stand. He like he broke down, and it was clear that he was not told ahead of time that he was going to be shown a photograph of of his friend. So these indigenous witnesses were painted as drunken, reckless, thieving indigenous indigenous men, playing into a stereotype that is seen and felt in this territory, and that's what feeds the racism to this day. The, the comments online yesterday and today are so ugly. Like the CRCC found that Debbie Baptiste was discriminated against. They found that the RCMP shouldn't have went to her trailer and, and delivered the death notification in the manner that they did that by smelling her breath, they were stereotyping her. But it's all in black and white on paper. What, what more do people need to know 
uh, realize that she's not drinking. Well, they just can't let go of this stereotype of the justification that they have that Colton Bushi deserved to be shot because he was drinking. He was probably, he was, you know, he must have been committing a crime because he was a drunken, reckless thief. But as you said, he wasn't, he wasn't committing a crime. He had no criminal record. He was sleeping in the back seat. When those two men in the front seat, those two other Indigenous young men, when they got out to run, that's when Gerald Stanley shot what those, what, what they said were warning shots, what Gerald Stanley said were warning shots. And this to me is a really pivotal part of the trial is those warning shots because the witnesses who were running, they testified that they felt those bullets go whizzing by their head. That's, were, that to me doesn't indicate a warning shot. Yet the crown, the crown made like, you know how you make admissions in a trial on facts? Well, that, that was a fact that was admitted that those two shots sh fired were warning shots. And even it, though it was a pro, even though it was a restricted weapon that a Tokarev that's not supposed to be shot at, at anyone, like not even at that coyotes or gophers or whatever he said he was shooting it at. Like you're only supposed to shoot them at a, a firing range. Well, and, and just the very language of a warning shot, warning of what, that you're next? Warning of what? Yeah, warning of what? And, you know, one of those young men, and these were young men, I don't think anybody was over 25, right? Um, they, they were running so fast for their lives, one of them ran right out of his shoes and right. ran down to the highway in his sock feet trying to escape this hail of bullets that was, you know, warning them. Um, and, you know, and then Gerald Stanley goes back and approaches the vehicle and shoots Colton Boshi right here. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I am very, um, I try to be a reasonable human. I try to understand, I try to understand the limitations that, that law enforcement faces. I try to understand the lack of understanding that media outlets have. I try to understand in order that I can make meaningful suggestions about how to fix this. But this, just all of it, the media response, the, the, the popular response from the general population in Saskatchewan, the response of the courts, the response of the police, all of it, I cannot, I just cannot understand it. I cannot understand it. I cannot find anything in my contemplation of it other than, other than just plain out and out systemic racism. And, you know, it's so ironic that this happened in Saskatchewan. And I think about the history of the, the RCMP who started mm -hmm. a paramilitary force as, as the Northwest Mounted Police with the specific purpose of clearing the plains. Everybody needs to read this book. It mm -hmm. is, it started as the master's thesis of James Daszak um, and out of the University of uh, Manitoba. And it is one of the most careful, dedicated, um, thorough histories of that time in, in our colonial history when methods, military methods, starvation methods, um, all of those types of terrible tools of colonialism were being used to subjugate the indigenous people of the plains and to allow for the, um, the assumption of the land, the takeover of the land and the resources by, by non-indigenous people and by the prairie farmers. And these are the ancestors, these are the descendants of those same prairie farmers that were, um, you know, were being protected then by the Northwest Mounted Police so that they could complete um, a colonial thievery of our lands and our resources. So this to me just feels like, 
I mean, it's so incomprehensible to me as a person, but to me as a person who considers history, it's completely in line. It's completely predictable. It's completely consistent with, with the roots of the RCMP and their, and their paramilitary force. My great grandmother was chased across the border into Montana following the, the incident at Frog Lake. <laughs> and, you know, it, you know, which occurred, it was another death that occurred, this time death of a, no, of a non-Indigenous person in 1885, because the people were being starved. They were being starved outright um, because the Indian agent wouldn't give them the rations that had been provided for in treaty and um, the, um, <laughs> yeah, and the, the general promises associated with, with treaty that were completely forgotten the moment the X's were on the page. And, um, and this is no different to me. This is no different from the Indian agent or the farm instructor to butcher their own cattle. Almighty Voice's family was starving because they wouldn't give him. Oh, I'm unstable. Oh, am I back yet? Because they wouldn't give him permission to slaughter one of his own cows. So he slaughtered one of his own cows. He was taken to jail. He escaped and was ultimately tracked down and killed with small cannon in a copse of trees in, in Saskatchewan. This is, this just seems no different to me, Eleanor. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the only other comment that I have, like, it, and in the movie, Tash, Tash Hubbard does a really great job of telling that history of, um, of the Northwest Mountain Police and the so-called rebellion. Yeah. The only, the only other point that I have to say about the trial itself is that the moment of the verdict. So at the, like all throughout the trial, the, the fan, like I think everybody, every indigenous person in this country in, in uh, actually in the world, because the world was watching, they still are watching. Um, they had hope. They had a hope that that Gerald Stanley would have been found guilty of something. And and you know, when you're talking about all the charges that should have been laid, like I don't know what the Crown's decision was not to um, charge Lisa Stanley or Gerald Stanley or like if I, I'll say if it was an indigenous accused who uh, got charged with murder, there'd be, you know, 10 or 12 other charges accompanying that one. Yeah. Yeah, it would be like number of informations or a number of charges, but this was minimal. And, and the other witnesses, like Sheldon Stanley hit the vehicle with a hammer. That, that's, you know, that's, that's like vandalism, uh, mischief. No charge. No charge. So that's assault with a weapon, you could argue too. Like assault with yes, a weapon. Yes, it is assault with a weapon. Yeah. And the other, you know, the other thing too is that those those young two young girls that were in the vehicle, one of them was Colton's girlfriend and right. was sitting right behind him when he beside was beside him. Shot. Right beside him. Beside, sorry, beside him when he was shot in the head. And, uh, and they jumped out of the vehicle and their evidence was that Mrs. Stanley said to them, that's what you get. That's what you get if you trespass and steal. Of course, they hadn't stolen anything. And uh, they responded by punching her. And they I believe that she was originally charged with assault. Yeah, they were charged with assault. And then the charges were later dropped. But, you know, and the, I mean, just imagine the horror of this. And we talk about, you know, especially Eleanor and I have talked about this in our lives, I am sure, about the intergenerational impacts of trauma. And I, I have not ever been able to stop thinking about those young people and, you know, how this is going to affect them in terms of the rest of their lives. And, uh, and, you know, 
and yeah, and how, you know, how can can these young people be expected to trust the RCMP when they see things like this, right? They see things like this, where clearly Indigenous lives don't matter. So I think uh, if you if you don't have anything just to add just now, I'm going to open. Well, I have I have one more little thing to add. <laughs> it's just how they it's how the Saskatchewan government. Um, I have two comments on them. I have many things to say about them, but I have two comments right now. They chose not to appeal the the verdict, and they they did it by press conference. So. Mm -hmm. In my 20 plus years of practicing law, I have never witnessed the Crown hold a press conference not to appeal. And to add further insult to that, they decided to tell the family two hours before the press conference. Therefore, the family would not have enough time to go or to organize a response, right? Like they could have, the, how many, like they must have known they were going to have this press conference, but then they just, you know, there was no courtesy to the family. There was no communication between the crown and the family. Like the crown is supposed to represent the victim, right? But, and, and I've seen crown crowns be very good with the victim, the victim's families. Like I've seen that relationship develop, but this, this one, there was no, no relationship. Like they were excluded. They were, they absolutely they were. were. There was a meeting um, in, uh, I believe it was sometime in the spring of 2017. And I just happened to be out on the res visiting my 97 year old auntie. <laughs> and uh, Alvin asked me if I would go. It was um, in where the Crown and the RCMP were wanting to meet with the family and witnesses in terms of um, preparation for the preliminary hearing. And it was so evident to me that they were just talking at cross purposes, that they couldn't, they just were inept in terms of communicating to the family, absolutely inept. And I, I did my best to facilitate that so that the family could, you know, be clear about what was coming next and so on. But you know, that has to change. It has to change. And it, and it can't happen on the RCMP's terms, on the government's terms. This has to happen in the context of a systemic change. It's a deeply systemic problem that is as intimately woven into the fabric of Canadian society as the national anthem. And so it's not something that's going to be effectively undertaken by the RCMP itself. It's something that has to happen in a different way. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the other comment I wanted to make was about um, the, the Saskatchewan government's lack of uh, prosecution of all the hate, <sighs> all the hate that was directed towards, <clears throat> towards the family. Um, there was an article that came out last month from the Canadian press where they said that <clears throat> one of the reasons why they weren't um, going to prosecute all of the online social media uh, comments of hate and racism was because public shame was punishment was was a, was a good way to punish the people. But and that to me, like, they just don't want to do anything like <laughs> They won't acknowledge the race problem. They won't acknowledge um, like any sort of rights of indigenous people in this province. They just refuse. Well, and the reality and is that there is no public shame. Those people were making those hideous, horrible uh, statements promoting violence and hatred and racism gleefully and happily. They were proud of it. There's mm -hmm. no. It, they experienced no shame in what they were saying and doing. They absolutely did not. And so if they're saying shame is enough, then it's not enough because there was no shame. And that is true. <laughs> you know, they, were pretty, they were proud. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wah, wah. That's all I can say is wash the gats, Eleanor. <laughs> uh, so, um, so with that, if anybody has questions, please put them in the chat. If anybody, you don't have to have a question. If you just, um, you know, want to have something to say, then please put it in the uh, in the chat. And there's one here from uh, Stuart Cameron to everybody. Who and Stuart is a, a Cree Soto person from uh, Northeast British Columbia. Protect the castle at all costs comes from historical European words that justify killing of others who seem to be or may look at look to have intentions of raiding their castle. So hence they brought themselves onto our lands where they built their so-called castles. That statement to me really emphasizes the murderous right they feel they have to kill, to protect their castle. And it looks like it still plays a strong role in justifying that their castle was being or being under attack, therefore justifying them being able to murder. Don't think I could say it better. And, and this is something that played out, you know, sadly, something that played out uh, in the trial in terms of the emphasis in arguments and um, you know commentary from the defense with respect to put yourself in Jerry's shoes. What on earth? How can you answer that question? Put yourself in Jerry's shoes. Basically what he's boots. saying. Not his shoes, his boots. Oh, his boots. That's right. His boots. Okay. Put yourself in Jerry's boots. What is what is he saying? You would have killed this boy too if you were in Jerry's boots? Is that what the defense was saying? It seems to be. And yeah, they, they didn't they didn't outright and say that, but yeah. they threw around all this language. Yeah. They threw around stereotypes. We're getting your we're, we're getting your uh, we're getting your feedback again there, Eleanor. I can I can if you want to try and pop out again and pop back in, that would be great. Um, but even, you know, what Eleanor is saying is that was the insinuation, if not exactly the words. And, uh, and really it is the Crown saying, you know, face it, all white Saskatchewan jury. Um, you know, if it had been your driveway, um, your farm, you know, you would have shot him too and you know it. And that is just, uh, um, yeah. That is just absolutely outrageous. I have a comment here from somebody that says, oh, and by the way, everybody, I put the link to the film that Eleanor was referring to. It's in the, it's in the chat to everybody. So if you wanna see it, it's there. And it goes into tremendous detail that will help augment what we've been able to do today. And um, um, somebody has said, please go out and talk about the appalling court case remind Canadians what it's like to deal with a system that is hell-bent on destroying us. This is from Renee. Thank you, Renee. Well, and this is something that Eleanor has been doing, Eleanor and the family and um, the other legal counsel that is working with the family. They've been doing this since 2016. They went to the UN. They've been all over trying to raise um, the profile of what happened and why and what that represents in terms of um, you know, extremely, um, extremely uh, broken um, justice system that is um, riddled with racist assumptions. So uh, let's see. Sorry to ask a theoretical question, Stephen Bath. <laughs> um, Given the traumatic experience you've witnessed and spoken about, can you feel that caste as an overarching concept may be a way to, sorry, may be a way to bring to account the systemic racism in Canada? That is to understand the universal presence of discrimination and suppression in all of its abhorrent manifestation as example of caste systems, including our British colonially inherited caste definitions based on race. The experience of African-American people in the US, the Jewish people in Nazi Germany, the untouchable people in India, as analyzed in Isabel Wilkerson's caste, 
are sickening parallels to the treatment you've shared of our can Canadian Indigenous people. Um, well, yes, and um, <laughs> uh, okay, Renee, you meant to ask everybody to go out and talk about it. Um, well, you know, and absolutely, but that information has been out there for hundreds of years. That information is documented in the history books in terms, you know, um, certain types of, of scholars that have uh, undertaken academic analysis of the, um, you know, the, the fallout of colonial racism um, and, you know, the impact on Indigenous populations. And I, I, I mean, I agree that, that all of, I, I agree, you know, with your notion, but what it really comes down to, in my humble opinion, is the ability of the listener, the ability of the, of the listener to process and accept the truth of racism in Canada, whether, um, you know, in particular against Indigenous people, uh, because that racism rose out of the colonial agenda. It rose out of the uh, effort and desire to, um, to own this land. You know, something that's really, really interesting to me is the purchase of Rupert's land. And this is something that is um, um, expressed in, in that book I recommended by James Daschick, is that colonial Canadians when Rupert's land was purchased, I think it was, I can't remember the date. Um, it was perceived that the indigenous people came with it. So that the indigenous people became um, possessions. They became colonial possessions. And this is something that, you know, I try to be gentle about it, but it's something that irritates me tremendously when I see references to our native people, our indigenous people, our Indians, if you will, our Aboriginal people, as though we belong as possessions to, um, you know, to the rest of Canada. And, <clears throat> And, you know, and I think that if you think of it in that context, that we came along with the purchase of Rupert's land, right? Um, then I think it helps to, to provide some clarity about, about the sense of superiority uh, of position that non-Indigenous people in Canada, and I don't use that term in a blanket sense, but that their sense that, that it is within their right to determine our future because we became a possession when Rupert's land was purchased. And, um, and, and it's, <laughs> it's so troubling <laughs> to think that this is something that has been uh, you know, promoted through the years and has, whether that's subconscious or not. So, but anyway, I was just talking about Rupert's land, um, you know, the area that became known as the Northwest Territories that was really Saskatchewan, Alberta, um, parts of Manitoba and the Northern States and how when that was purchased from the Hudson's Bay by colonial Canada, um, there was a sense of Indigenous people then being owned um, as well as the land was considered to be owned. Um, Alan, could you put up the uh, the image that I gave you of Maria Campbell. Maybe. <laughs> Alan, are you there? Here we go. Eleanor, can I get you to read this? Because I'm pretty sure I'm going to pronounce that Cree word incorrectly. Okay, I'll just pronounce it incorrectly. <laughs> you cannot reconcile a relationship that never existed. We don't need any more stories. We have closets full of stories. There is no word in Cree for reconciliation. 
only Kweskastasuin, which means setting things right, restoring what is ours would set things right, giving our land back would set things right. And this is from the luminous Maria Campbell, author, activist, elder. Um, you can take that down now. Alan, there we go. And, um, <clears throat> and this is sort of at the heart of our conversation here at, um, in, the, in the lecture series that we've had is, is reconciliation possible? And in some of the earlier lectures, I talked about how I see reconciliation. I see it in the same sense as Maria sees it, but I've described it as seeing it in the bookkeeping sense. When you balance your bank statement with your bank, when you bring it back to balance and the situation of what happened with Colton, uh, what happened with his mother, what has happened through this long, long journey that Eleanor has contributed so significantly to in terms of trying to find some kind of justice, right, is evidence of the fact that, you know, we are so far, so far from achieving that kind of balance. And when we were, when we were conversing with, uh, with Dr. John Boros, um, OC, um, uh, one of his books is about uh, reconciliation and resurgence. And there's a really great summary that I like from that. And it is that the two major schools of thought in indigenous settler relations on the ground, in the courts, in public policy, and in research are resurgence and reconciliation. Resurgence refers to practices of indigenous self-determination and cultural renewal whereas reconciliation refers to practices of reconciliation between indigenous and settler nations, such as nation to nation treaty negotiations like modern day treaties. Reconciliation also refers to the sustainable reconciliation of both indigenous and settler peoples with the living earth as the grounds for both resurgence and indigenous settler reconciliation. And to me, the notion of reconciliation um, is an unattainable goal unless there is room for resurgence. And that means the resources, the lands, you know, the, uh, the right to self-determination, the right to self-governance and not in the you know, Canadian government's uh, idea of what self-governance self is. Um, but unless, and the case of Colton Bushi is such a bitter example of how deep the racism flows in the institutions of this country. And unless those institutions themselves are prepared to break it down and start again, there won't be substantive change. There simply won't be. And that's what it takes. Um, one of the things that Jessica McDermott was going to speak about tonight and will when we bring her in was the idea of an effective ally and how non-Indigenous people can be meaningful allies to um, Indigenous people. And that kind of relationship as allies is very, very, very important. Um, but allies are equals. And I was recently reading an article about how sometimes people who identify them, non-Indigenous non people who identify themselves as allies um, can express, you know, some fairly racist bias and they're, do but they're doing it unintentionally. They're not particularly aware of it, but they're excused. Their conduct is excused because they have good intentions and that can't, that can't continue. It, it just can't continue. There has to be a willingness, a meaningful willingness and commitment on the part of non-Indigenous Canadians to stand behind us and to do so in the best interests of, of Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. And so I'll see if there's any... Um, 
Okay, here's a comment from Mark. We are realizing that for many US citizens, it is literally unthinkable that they should share resources fairly with fellow citizens, to say nothing of new immigrants who do not look like them. It appears more and more as if the justice that is needed in Canada with respect to Indigenous peoples is equally unthinkable to large numbers of people. Are we hitting the limits of our fabled democratic societies? Is this a kind of challenge that Western democracy was never designed for? How do we do democracy if that's what's still needed beyond or outside colonialism? He doesn't expect quick answers, <laughs> but is uh, reframing the question to himself out loud and to us. And, but the, the, it really comes down to, uh, to intent in so many ways, as Eleanor comments, we have treaties and those treaties were entered into on a nation to nation basis, not on the basis of one, one population being superior to another. Um, and if only, if only people get, get past the notion, non-Indigenous people could get past the notion that they are conferring rights upon us and that the rights that we have are at their pleasure. If they can get beyond that, maybe we will get to a place of true reconciliation, setting things right, as Maria Campbell states. And uh, as Anderson says in the comments, excuse me, reconciliation will not be achieved if one side believes it is based on the recognition of rights and the other believes that it is an act of benevolence. And that's just exactly what I was trying to say, right, is uh, you're, you don't give me my rights. My creator gave me my rights, right? And, uh, and that's, um, yeah, and that's that. So, but it, that is such an important concept that's so important for people to consider, you know, to check themselves and do they see themselves as being a part of a majority and that it is within their rights and authority to make decisions about what is my rights and authority? What are the jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictions and rights of Indigenous people in the country? Can we get past that? I don't know. I hope so. I truly do. Any other thoughts? Come on, you guys, ask some questions. <laughs> uh, okay. And my friend Stuart, I, I don't know if, if everybody heard about the terrible uh, press release of um, the mayor of Puskupi in northern northeastern British Columbia. Another example of just terrible ignorance and racism. And he's he's going to be doing some awareness workshops up there. And uh, and he told me earlier that he told them he would do the work, but he wasn't going to teach them how to hunt or do or make dry meat. <laughs> Which, you know, and I mean that sort of as a joke, but not entirely, because that is what that is what people expect when Indigenous people come in to do cultural awareness, that they're going to get a craft or a skill demonstration as opposed to a history lesson. And what people really need is to reconceive of history, reconceive of the history of North America and to think about it from our perspective which is, by the way, the subject of my next book. <laughs> um, so with that, Eleanor, say something. Well, in, for final comments, the, this story needs to be told because you you, you've only got a little bit of it. Um, <clears throat> so we are pushing for, we're still pushing for uh, inquiry but I don't think we'll get it from the Saskatchewan government. We're still pushing for a Royal Commission. <clears throat> um, if you could write your uh, MP and ask them to push for a uh, Royal Commission, that would be great. Uh, or even a, like a study on systemic racism. Like I know we've been studied, we've been reported on, we've been 
um, analyzed, but, but this story needs to come out like it really does. Because as you can see, they're destroying, they destroyed evidence already. They destroyed the communications that were um, between the members on the day Colton was killed. So, and who knows what that, that radio communication said. I, I can probably take some good guesses what it said, but never looks good when, when, a, when somebody destroys evidence, especially in the light of a civil, a possible civil trial, or um, like even when they were doing the investigation for the CRCC, they, they still destroyed it. They said, well, we have, we only, we only have to keep it two years. So after that, we can, we can get rid of it. And that, you know, that's not right. Um, we're taking that very seriously, very seriously. Why? If they, the things are so, you know, you would think, oops, I think I'm gone away again. You would think, tell me when I'm back, Eleanor, am I back? You would think that if um, everything was on the up and up, that, you know, somebody wouldn't have taken the extraordinary step of intentionally destroying those communications. It's a terrible thing. Hello, Renee. I've enjoyed seeing you at these um, at these lectures that we've been having. And uh, one of the things that Renee says in her comments is it's so hard being Indigenous. It's always implied I've done something wrong. I feel for the Bushi family. Time to overhaul the police. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so um, we're coming to a close, uh, close soon, but not just yet. And I want to let people know that we will be picking up with another uh, four lectures starting in September. And I hope to see some of the faces here. Um, we'll be looking at, uh, well, we're gonna have some brilliant speakers, I can tell you that. Certainly we're going to have Jessica McDermott today, or then, who was supposed to appear today and uh, who did such a tremendous job on um, uh, summarizing the history of how the, um, the issue of the missing and murdered women along Highway 16 in BC has not been addressed appropriately by the RCMP. Um, and we're also going to be having Dr. Raven Sinclair, who is an expert on the 60s scoop and the foundation of that, um, that, um, uh, I can't think of another way to say it, I'm not well, that bastard child of the residential school legacy. <laughs> so anyway, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Vesey, the principal of Green College, and I, I think he'd like to say a few words. Thank you very much, Michelle. I won't keep people up for, 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 for very long, but I did want to say a special word of thanks uh, to Eleanor for joining us at, at such a timely moment uh, and at sh such short notice. And, and to you, of course, Michelle, for making this happen and for everything else that you've made happen over the last few weeks. Uh, of course, at Green College, we, we traditionally like to think of ourselves as part of a university that is a place of learning. Um, I'd like to pick up on a note that just went into the chat and suggest that thanks to this series, you, you have enabled us perhaps to look towards turning the college at least some of the time into a place of unlearning, which may be the much harder role to play socially. Uh, and yet the importance of that unlearning in this context is becoming clearer and clearer. It's very hard for, for us, and I'm speaking now, you know, for the settler population of which I'm so conspicuously, obviously <laughs> a member, it is so hard for us to get our heads around these things. And that's because huh, we have done such a great job over the years of creating the institutional and conceptual structures uh, in which horrific uh, events like the ones that have been recalled this evening uh, come to appear part of an established order. Undoing that is a multi-generational problem, uh, problem and project. It's going to take pedagogies and skills and de-institutions of a kind that we can't quite envisage yet. Um, but 
having this kind of presentation discussion um, as, as part of uh, an unlearning, uh, let's hope, uh, will, will help. In any case, uh, Michelle, we're, we're looking forward with excitement already um, to having you and uh, your next few guests, whether live and on screen or in some other combination, uh, we're going to wait and see. Green College will resume its public programming in September and we'll do it by whatever means are available and uh, convenient at that point. Uh, and we're dearly hoping that Michelle will be here in residence in person and that she'll be able to host visitors here on this wonderful, blessed piece of Musqueam territory, unceded, ancestral, occupied by Green College. Uh, if we can have some of what she and her guests do go out in other media as well so that more people can, 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 can see it and benefit from it, we will. In any case, everything that we can, we'll put up on the YouTube, YouTube channel uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep the discussion going that way too. Thank you all and do come, come, come back soon, as soon as you see the opportunity and be well. Yes. Well, and I'd, I'd also really like to thank Eleanor for joining us today and like I say on such short notice um, and uh, and I really hope that her very uh, intimate insight into what happened in this case has assisted people to um, inspire themselves to to learn more watch Tasha Hubbard's film um, I'm sure that there are some you know records about the presentations that were made to the UN go read them read the CRCC report. Um, and you know what? As much as I hate to say it, go read those awful comments. Go back in time to 2016 and read those awful comments and you'll know what we live with. You'll know what we're talking about. And I thank each and every one of you for open hearts and open minds and for joining us today. And I'm really excited about seeing some of you again in the fall. <laughs>